Welcome, Climate Viewers. My name is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at climateviewer.com, climateviewer.org, and weathermodificationhistory.com. It is May 6, 2018, and today I will be interviewing a legend, Max Bliss, um, one of my homies, a brother from another mother. He's from France, and uh, we've had a long history together. Um, some of you may already know this, that Max attended the EPA hearing where we went up to Washington, D.C. and basically um, harassed the EPA about planes making clouds. And one of my favorite uh, quotes I ever heard was right here at the tail end. You can see Max Bliss right there, and he said this. Engineering for geopolitical ends. We do not need to be scientists to observe the sky and see the obvious negative effects aviation is having and research the spiraling health impacts. Just start looking up and wake up. We do not consent to the use of weather and climate modification or the despotic new world order. God bless and peace for all. Boom. So y y you just can't get any better than that. Um, you know, Max, right up there, EPA televised on c-span talking about the new world order um i was so impressed with everybody who came along you could see patrick roddy to his left amanda bays right behind him another gentleman michael saraceno came with us so the five of us took on the epa and really uh you know told them what for and uh max is you know a longtime researcher he uh He's attended the Berlin Climate Engineering Conference, toured all over Europe in the anti-chemtrail van. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight is, you know, what's the deal with all these clouds, the language behind it, and why people are so upset. Um, so with that being said, Max, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, cool. Jim. Glad to have you, brother man. Well, I'm glad to have you as well. Man. I can honestly say that um, I really admire everything you've been doing. I think your website is by far and away the absolute best website you can find to explain what's happening in the sky. So I really appreciate everything you've done. I appreciate that too, man. And, and for the record, for those who don't know, Max sends me more research than anybody else, period. Um, I get emails from him every single day. I read them, and regularly he shocks me with what he finds. Um, Max previously had a YouTube channel with 10,000 subscribers on it. Uh, if he feels like talking about that story later on, maybe we will. But um, regardless, uh, Max has had a huge following for a long time. He's a great researcher. And we're really going to break down some of the, you know, myths and mysteries behind chemtrails, contrail series, and all the language that kind of gets in the way. So, Max, first of all, why don't you give everybody your definition of the difference between a chemtrail and contrail, persistent contrail? What, how do you see it? Well, I see the word chemtrail as a little bit of um, a verbal trap. Um, for me, I would define a chemtrail as a deliberately created contrail for the purposes of weather or atmospheric modification. If you choose to try and make contact with the establishment and talk about chemtrails, then you will meet a set of predetermined answers because they're looking to pigeonhole you. So that, so that you can't make any progress, so that they can't take you seriously. If, for them, it's great. You say chemtrails, and automatically they've got predetermined responses. They know how to deal with that. They're, they're, you're not going to get anywhere, really. But the truth is, a chemtrail, in my mind, is a deliberately created contrail uh, for the purposes of weather and atmospheric modification, which means if you want to get somewhere and talk to scientists or the or members of the establishment your local representative or whatever then if you talk about contrails um causing harm to the environment uh for example in all fresh contrails there are spherical ice crystals 
and spherical ice crystals actually intensify the solar radiation. Mm-hmm. So um, um, there's something called Me scattering, M-I-E. Mm-hmm. And this uh, has been mentioned in some of the patents by Peter Swan, which is a favorite of ours. Yeah. Um, it's also mentioned in the uh, EU biofuels, contrails for biofuels scoping study. Yeah, uh, biofuels for contrail control. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And and they specifically state, oh, they actually talk about me theory rather than me scattering. But basically, me theory means that you get a forward scattering of the solar rays. And that includes UV, gamma rays, X-rays, and all, the whole scale of energy coming from the sun is intensified by up to 1.5 times, which is quite uh, a huge impact. So yeah, they work as little magnifying glasses. Exactly, exactly. So when we see our skies littered with contrails, they are intensifying solar radiation. Yeah. And then as those contrails mature and they turn into cirrus clouds, they then the ice. I want you to re- hold on. I want you to repeat that for everybody because that's that's where the the, the real language problem breakdown b- occurs. Is that that when when pe- when whether it was a chemtrail, contrail, persistent contrail, regardless, what you end up with is a cirrus cloud. Absolutely, um, but so so. But I want to try and describe a feedback loop, a warming feedback loop. Mm-hmm. So what we're getting is the magnifying effect from the fresh contrails Mm -hmm. with with all the spherical ice crystals and also could be spherical particles not necessarily just ice crystals Mm -hmm. spherical particles uh, have the effect of forward scattering the energy that they're being hit with so the sun's energy gets forward scattered intensified so that then warms up the surface of the earth. You know, if you touch something that's out in the sun, could be a metal bench, could be the road, could be concrete wall or something, you could feel the heat. It's tremendous. Mm-hmm. Especially if you go from the shade into the direct sunlight on one of those days when there's lots of contrails, the difference in heat is is tremendous. You know, the burning factor. Yeah. So... So that heat then uh, is, is, turns into long wave radiation, is reflected back out into the atmosphere. And that gets trapped by the mature contrails that turn into cirrus clouds. This is a fact, and that's one of my major focuses. That's what I spoke about at the EPA hearing, was the heat trapping effect of cirrus clouds. And basically, it's, you know, it's kind of like what I call the Venus effect. Um, the planet Venus is covered in sulfuric acid clouds. And it will be forevermore. And that's our future if we don't really deal with this pragmatically. Um, when you're approaching scientists, you need to be well-educated and speak their language. Um, whether you like it or not. Um, because language is the breakdown. And, and for people to go to them and say, you know, well, I just see chemtrails everywhere. Um, they're going to look at you and say chemtrails are not a thing. And when I talk to the public, half the time I say, you know, chemtrails, because if I say contrail-induced cirrus, aviation-induced cloudiness, or any of the terms that you see in the science literature, they'll go, you're a shill. Um, and, and both of those breakdowns, I think, you know, that they are straw men that are set up for that purpose. You know, let's have a breakdown in communication so that people can't talk about, you know, the most important factors um, that airplanes make clouds you don't need to be a scientist to know that part you can be as sciencey as you like like you said it's your thing you know you don't need to be a scientist to look up and see that something's really really wrong and you know whether we talk about short wave versus long wave climate engineering um cirrus cloud seeding how they want to melt these clouds away um, Ken Caldera's latest paper, Cocktail Geoengineering, where he literally said, if we melt the cirrus clouds away, we will never re- need to do solar radiation management. So this led me to a new term called Earth Radiation Management. So for those who don't know, SRM, Solar Radiation Management, is a geoengineering technology that is used to mimic volcanoes by spraying aerosols into the sky to block incoming sunlight 
And what Max is talking about is the heat trapping at the ground and then not being able to escape to space. And that not escaping to space is Earth radiation management or melting cirrus clouds because these contrails that produce cirrus clouds are trapping heat like a blanket. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, but I would say that solar radiation management is not just about limiting the amount of solar, solar rays. It's, it's, it's like it says, solar radiation management can also mean intensifying solar rays, which is what young or fresh contrails do. Mm -hmm. um, so we've all seen the skies absolutely crisscrossed with chemtrails. We know about the grids and we know about the placement Mm -hmm. um, why they're doing this and th there are other elements to this as well that uh, I would like to cover at some point about the electrical modification of the atmosphere for mm -hmm. modification because of ice crystal shape and what they're doing how how even how a contrail is can be specifically electrically charged Kimi ions yeah 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 absolutely and uh, th there's plenty of patents about adding ions to get a desired polarity in well, the exhaust plume yeah and, and, and to that you you had sent me a paper that really proved my case beyond a shadow of a doubt because what i said at the epa hearing was that they were trying to get a desired effect and whether you want to call this accidental geoengineering or not it is no longer an accident when you start making statements like we want to make clouds by day, none by night. And the reason why is because cirrus clouds trap heat at night predominantly. At night, the heat should escape back into space, but it's not. And during the day, they do offer some cooling, but it's not controlled. It's completely an experiment. Um, and in some cases, it exacerbates that. I hear all the time from people in California about how they go out in the sun and they literally cannot go outside without shades because it's so intense and it's burning trees, things like that. Yeah, it's, it's not just there. It's everywhere, really, Jim. I mean, mm -hmm. I would ask anyone um, to do a simple experiment. When there's a day when there's an awful lot of chem, uh, contrails or chemtrails in the sky and, you know, it's warmer than it should be, just stand in the shade for like 10 to 15 seconds and kind of gauge to yourself how you're feeling. And then walk out into the uh, magnified sunshine and then register the burning sensation on your skin. And you know that that is not a greenhouse effect due to co2 that is the intensification of solar rays yeah it's a very simple experiment very mm -hmm. simple and you know i was in arizona and arizona versus south carolina <clears throat> there's an even it, it, it's exacerbated because in south carolina we have a lot of humidity so you know water vapor traps heat and it when i was in arizona if I went in the shade, I mean, there was a, a much larger difference in cool versus hot in the sun. Whereas in South Carolina, it's not as big a, you know, a, a difference because it's 100% humidity almost every single day. That's why they, they train the U.S. Army and Marines here in South Carolina. Because if you could deal with 100% humidity in all that gear, then you can deal with it in, in, in the, anywhere in the world. Um but yeah, I agree with you that you know it is it does have intensification process properties. Um, it does trap heat at the ground level. That affects winds at ground level. In addition, you know that it 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 actually affects ground level winds, which affects other pollution. So instead of that pollution being blown away, now we've decreased winds at the ground, and and people are you know getting sicker because of that. I mean, there are so many effects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but my point about this is, this isn't global warming. This is kind of a temporary regional warming. When, when mm -hmm. these programs are running and places are being warmer than they should be, um, that's a temporary regional warming. That's not global warming, like a runaway global warming or something. That's an intensification of heat in your local region. Where, and that, okay, that might be happening in many places all over the world. But that's not a long-lasting effect. And the reason we know that for sure is when the planes are grounded on 9-11, following 9-11, mm -hmm. and 
Uh, similarly, it happened in Australia when a volcano went off in Indonesia, and it happened in the UK mm-hmm. with the paper you like to use so much by Jim Hayward with five thousand times. Uh, five ta- uh, yeah, five thousand times the effect of all the CO two produced by aviation since the start of aviation. And just a little uh-huh. context on that. He um, there was an E three AWACS doing circles over the UK. There were no other clouds in sight. And they made con, you know, a contrail cirrus cloud that literally covered almost all of the UK. Um, I just recently interviewed doc, Dr. Daniel Rosenfeld from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and I asked him about that, and he said, "Well, you know, that paper still isn't 100 percent true because there was a volcano, which meant there was a lot of soot, so there was a lot of cloud condensation nuclei or ice nucleating particles. They've now renamed them for some reason, but regardless, he says, "Oh no, that's more to do with the volcano than the E3 AWACS that made all." Uh, I just, I, I, I just. Showed Shook my head and went they, okay. They, they do have their they, uh, get out clause, haven't they? But it was interesting because the satellite image was did show a, a very clear UK, which is very very rare these days. Yeah, it's exceptionally rare. And the only reason you could see a very clear UK was because of all the planes around. And the, and the same thing happened yeah. that with the Travis Menace paper. That was the nine eleven paper. It's called diurnal temperature range was affected by the groundings um and basically there were no flights except for george bush and two f-16s hauling butt back to washington dc so they got to see a huge chemtrail contrail you know um on the satellite that they could measure without a lot of noise and noise is the problems the problem is that at 110,000 flights a day, that everybody's making clouds. So how could you possibly tell the difference between a man-made one and a non, you know, non-natural artificial cloud? So they just chalk it up to, well, cirrus clouds are a great unknown according to the IPCC. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's that's the rub right there is that they don't want to they don't want responsibility for it. And as you put it, because the despotic new world order, guess what, globalists need planes to fly all over the dang globe um and most of them own private jets to fly to these climate conferences yet um the airline industry has never been regulated when we went to that epa hearing it was about does does jet aircraft emissions affect human health and all of us said resoundingly yeah we're concerned about metal particles coming out of planes and planes making clouds and what did they do they threw out the lawsuit. The EPA said they were going to write regulations. Then Obama, China, the EU all got together and signed an alternative aviation fuel pact where they were going to use biofuels to try to get out from under their carbon taxes they were about to incur. And you know now that plan is full steam ahead. And even the the guys that were there with us, Friends of the Earth, Sierra Club, the Sierra Club that smarted off to me afterwards, I was like, what would you think about the, the, the cloud thing that we were all talking about? He says, oh, that's pure puppycock. Well, months later, after they threw, our, threw the lawsuit out and decided to use biofuels for contrail control, those same NGOs came out and said, oh, my God. Um, this is going to be worse than it was before because now they're literally buying up farmland all over the world to grow gasoline to greenwash their way out of this. And that's yeah. the insanity yeah. of this. Yeah. It is really insanity. Um, I mean, the, the biofuels is also a kind of license to introduce new types of fuels and, you know, as we know from the patents where you can have different fuels mixed in one tank or um that's your smoking gun one dude if you hadn't sent me that one dude i jumped up out of my seat i did a run around my backyard and it explains so much do you want to explain that one well yeah certainly um i actually have a a copy uh peter swan's done so many of them here actually this is one that's worth um trying to find it that's coming I can out. I can bring it up on the screen if you want me to I um, have I have screenshots so, of all that um, the interesting thing about um, the work is some of it involves a soot regulator okay which I think is quite interesting um, another part is being able to 
identify when a contrail is forming, the type of contrail you're getting, the thickness of it, the optical depth, and then a computer will um, control the amount of one or two multiple fuels potentially, uh, um, which would alter the type of exhaust plume that you're getting. Um, so I think the understanding of how a contrail for, is formed is, is much better understood than they try um, to, to, to publicize. Yeah, so I've got your patents up on the screen real quick. Let me just really quick show these people at home. This is from weathermodificationhistory.com. And the title of the article is Doped Jet Fuel. Just go to there and type in Doped Jet Fuel. U.S. Patent 9518965, Fuel System for Vapor Trail Control. Follow it up. Like, here's another one. Fuel Delivery System, two jet fuels, one tank for contrail control, and then the smoking gun one. Controlling unit and method for controlling the supply of a vehicle with multiple fuels. U.S. Patent Application 2011-0101166. And right here they show jet fuel electronic control unit. And what they're doing is they're mixing diesel fuel and biofuel in differing amounts so that they can get their uh, contrail control apparatus down. And that's a scary thing. So what they're really talking about here is, you know, turning their contrail frown upside down um, and, you know, basically getting out of this carbon taxes that they would incur. And, and hopefully they can get carbon credits. They can say, well, we're not actually, you know, I know we put out a lot of CO2. And I know that you technocrat, you know, balance load monsters are coming at us for carbon taxes because, you know, um, we have way more, you know, to do with this than anybody really wants to admit because the, the 5,000 time quote you know, all of those things that they're literally at a point now where they're, they're going to greenwash their way out of this and make money doing it and tell you you're crazy. If you say the word geoengineering, uh, chemtrails, tin full hat, nothing to see here. When this is like the biggest scandal in history, it's the most visible climate change there is on the planet. Your climate is changing every day over your house and they're doing it for a specific purpose. I don't. I don't actually know that. That's the entire reason that they're switching to biofuels is to avoid CO2 tax, because personally, um, I think there is substantial evidence to prove that CO2 is actually not driving climate. Um, I've got I agree some, with that. Um, recordings of CO2 measurements taken in the 19th century, as early as the 1820s. Uh, in various different locations, in in um, Switzerland, in Spain, in Scotland, in England, obviously just in Europe, but in high land, in low land, in city areas, in various different locations. And to be honest with you, the average CO2 measurements was um, 0.05, which is higher than it is today. Mm-hmm. Which would not be a surprise considering the amount of coal they were burning and everything else uh, in those days. But the fact remains that history um, has proven that we've had warmer periods before mm-hmm. than we have today. Even in America in the 1930s. I, I, yeah, I just um, did a video on the Dust Bowl. Yeah. You know, it, it's incredible. You know, okay, it's not in many people's lifetimes' memory. So I guess, you know, it's up to people to research a little bit of history. But the, the truth is, almost in living memory, for some people, it, we can remember times when it was hotter. Even in the UK, in 1976, when I was a small boy, I can remember when it was hotter, and we still haven't been as hot as we were then in 1976. So, and, and that was at a time when they were worried about an ice age. Yeah, before the the whole discussion was the the coming global cooling ice age. Yeah, and now that's you know done a complete reversal, and they'll keep flip flopping on that. Yeah, so so, but I want I want to stick with the CO two issue at the moment because the people who are doing geoengineering, or well, no, sorry, that's not correct. Uh, the people behind these programs to, and I believe they are deliberately altering the weather and climate as much as they can. I mean, 
I've got all these books here, and I, I, I've got you know so, so many books here about the climate and weather modification. They're all about climate and weather modification. Mm-hmm. And you know as well as I do, this is a very very old agenda. The science going back on this is over two hundred years old, and the framework for today's science that they're using weather modification is established over a hundred years ago. Yep. Now. The political agenda is about global governance. It's about bringing all the nations together under one umbrella. That umbrella being climate change. That's yep. the threat to the planet. I agree with you on that. And that's and that's the technocrats. That's the that's what technocracy is all about. Yep, I totally agree. Now, the interesting thing is the people who are behind. UN Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. Anything with sustainable in it. All the rest of it. (laughs) Or smart. Which which, uh, (laughs) sustainable development, I've got that book here. Um, Oh, crumbs, where's that book? It doesn't matter. I've got got the copy, original copy of it. Um, It's set up by the Rockefellers, by the Rothschilds, and it, it can be traced to these people. Well, these people are the ones that own all the oil and are driving uh, funding governments to have wars for oil and and basically they, they it appears to me that they're looking to control the entire resource of oil all around the planet which would include melting uh, poles if they can. That's can, been a hundred year agenda that back yeah. as far as Jules Verne talking about tilting the planet by firing a cannon to melt the poles and atomize the Arctic to melt the poles and put metal particles in space to melt the poles. Oh, they did that. Project Westford. Which is in this book here. Which yeah. Is, uh, yeah. This, this book is absolutely awesome. This is uh, Man versus Climate. I got Ever. a copy. Epic. I want that, man. I'm jelly. But yeah, so here's the thing. Here's the rub. I've got a 1961 paper um, on climate modification that's from a government report. And they said specifically that just the water vapor coming out of stratospheric plains would raise the temperature by 1.6 degrees Celsius. That's the exact same thing that the IPCC is saying, and that's what all of the guys who wanted to melt the poles to get to the oil and gas are saying. 1.5 is the magic number. So what does the IPCC say? We want to limit the heating to two, which means not too hot, not too cold, but the goal is still the same. Melt the freaking Arctic to get to all that oil and gas. And if you go to theguardian.com right now and you type in the new Cold War, you can see that right now Russia, America are in a war over that oil in the Arctic. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say that you're trying to green the planet to save the poles and save Arctic ice when the goal for 100 years has been to melt the poles. And that's exactly what the new science says. Greenland ice sheet melts more when it's cloudy. But you, you have to understand that it's an interesting thing about oil. We've all been deceived that it's a fossil fuel and a finite resource that will run out. That's, I don't believe that's true. I think uh, quite a lot of Soviet papers um, have proved that oil is made deep down in the Earth's surface as a process of the Earth's mechanism, the way it works. Mm-hmm. And basically, there will be a never-ending supply of oil. So if you think about it from a geopolitical Um, perspective if oil will never run out and it's available all over the planet in certain geological areas where it's easier to access then that means lots of nations could have independence it means that they don't have to subscribe to the new world order and they they don't necessarily have to agree to all the global governance from sustainable development the United Nations Agenda 21 so This is why I see a war for oil, the geoengineering of the poles to secure all the oil supplies because they're trying to switch us over to a new monopoly of electric cars. You know, this is like in Europe, they've talked about how they will not make um, petrol or diesel cars after 2040. 
you know, it's not very far away. It's only 22 years. And, they'd, and Norway has said within less than 10 years now that they will transfer, uh, they will stop oil production and transfer to just electric cars, which is crazy because Norway has one of the largest oil deposits in Europe, in the North Sea, next to what Britain has. Yeah, that, it's, it's, it's pure, pure insanity is what it is. Yeah. And it so is all about control. If, if you realize that CO2 is not driving the climate and CO2 actually greens the planet and it's essential for all life on this planet, because if plants weren't able to grow and thrive because of the lack of CO2, then we would all be suffering a famine because we need plants to eat. And so do the animals, if people eat animals. You know, it, it, it's pretty much a very, very important part of the cycle of life. CO2 is essential. It's plant it's food. Great, yeah, it's, it's absolutely essential. So they've demonized CO2. And that will give them the new legislation to start clamping down and controlling nations because of their CO2 output and the use of oil. So, I mean, what we're, what we're really talking about is this altering of weather and climate is about, first of all, bringing nations into line because like um, Iran, for example, has been suffering droughts and you know, the the previous president was saying that their rain was being stolen. Yeah, Ahmadinejad said straight yeah, out that, that yeah, he he said <laughs> that that um that basically technology in Europe was being used to steal the rain, and there's actually documented, um, you know, a history of that. Uh, there was a there was a project simultaneous to Operation Popeye going on where Henry Kissinger, um, and the CIA. Were running Operation Popeye, which was weather warfare over Laos. They were doing rain making, make mud, not war, using silver iodide and lead iodide. Most people don't know that. Um, when I interviewed Dr. Jim Fleming, he said that not even the people at the bases they were flying out of knew what they were doing. And they only used three, three to five planes to do this for the five years they were doing it. And even the Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, didn't know about it. What's even more scary is at the exact same time, they were doing a rain embargo on Cuba, and it was called Project Nile Blue. And the purpose of that was to do precipitation enhancement or cloud seeding out in the Gulf of Mexico so that all that rain fell into the ocean before it ever made it to Cuba to kill the Cuban sugar crops. And this was in 69 and 70. And I want to add something to that right there. Um, not only was that happening, um, they were also, and Henry Kissinger was the head of the weather modification panel, uh, one of the, on the director board uh, of um, weather modification panels. Um, President Johnson offered India weather modification to, uh, as, with, as a geopolitical leverage to bring them rain from an unusual drought that they were suffering in 1967. And I, I think that there's a quite clear um, suggestion that, that actually they created the drought first and then they offered a weather modification solution. Problem reaction gain, solution. Exactly. And and that's, that's quite well documented actually um, in 1967 in India. And there, there's breaking news on that because just just in the past couple months, there's an article up on climateviewer.com, black carbon destroys ozone. Black carbon from aviation destroys ozone, affects monsoons. The Indian Space Organization found um, black carbon spherules, spheres mm -hmm. as high as 18 kilometers in the sky, which is in you know through the ozone layer. And this is what David Keith... And the geoengineers were talking about it's called photophoretic self-levitation of carbon black dust so these black you know the soot is black if you've ever sat on a car hood that was black in the sunlight you'll burn your butt it absorbs heat readily and it will levitate upwards that soot is wrapped in sulfuric acid and filled with metal particles metal nanoparticles and 
the the latest research shows that these cirrus clouds are predominantly man-made metals are the the cloud condensation nuclei the soot the dust that it's sticking to is man-made metals so what's happening is planes are spewing out soot wrapped in sulfuric acid there is stratospheric sulfur injections because that soot floats all the way up through the ozone layer and along the way the metal is freed from it making clouds which also trap heat and affect rainfall so the indian space organization said that this carbon black they found could come from no other place than aviation this is monumental epic science happening and they are basically saying that the airline industry is screwing with their weather absolutely right out there in public that when I was at UNESCO uh, in 2015, I was speaking to an Indian scientist, and he was saying that they had found particles from ship tracks in the Himalayas uh, that were changing the, the surface uh, albedo of mm-hmm. the glaciers. So what they were saying is basically dirt from ship tracks were being carried and landing on on the glaciers and then changing the radiation balance Mm -hmm. and actually melting you know affecting their climate like that as well you know they're called they're called black highways and you can look this up um basically the the entire north pole is getting covered in monumental amounts of soot and they're they're banding together in these highways which tend to um, correlate with some of these polar arctic flights in addition and that that black on the surface is what's melting the ice in addition to the cloud layers that are trapping the heat you know and insulating the planet increase for 20 years nasa have shown a linear increase in cloud cover over the polar regions uh, for the well i don't actually i think this paper's about 10 years old so last 30 years uh, we've seen uh, an increase in cloud cover which is clearly to do with uh, polar flights um also an interesting thing is when they have big big fires huge forest fires mm-hmm. often the soot from the forest fires can get carried in um global circuits uh, air currents in the atmosphere up to the poles yeah Every, um, everything tends to end up there in the northern hemisphere and we've seen the polar vortexes and how they work i want to bring this up before we get any further on because since we're on the top of the arctic and and global warming there's a group called the arctic methane emergency group ameg and they wrote a letter to world leaders basically saying what we're talking about right here um we need to continue to use bunker fuel which is dirty diesel fuel in ships so that they create I, I more ship got tracks to you, i got to say something about that jim yeah go ahead um, when i was at cambridge university uh at the solar radiation management conference i spoke with dr stephen salter mm-hmm. and i asked him um about the tyros satellite and that was the first web satellite that went up in from America, and it went up in the 60, early 60s. But it wasn't until the mid or, or mid to late 60s that they first spotted a ship track. So I asked Dr. Stephen Salter, why why do you think it was that for five years or so that they didn't see any ship tracks with the satellite? And he said to me, oh, that's easy, because of the U.S. Clean Air Act. The U.S. Clean Air Act in 1967 required that road vehicles would have to have a, a lower sulfur content, as well as lead being removed. Uh, that's right. And they didn't regulate um, aircraft or, or ships vehicles. And he said, this is what he actually said to me, that they added sulfur that wasn't that was no longer used in road vehicles. They added that to the ship fuel. That's amazing, and that and that's the bunker they fuel that they're talking about. They and want the clouds. That's all a part of it. And if you look at the um, the Soviet um, climate modification proposals of the sixties, they obviously were going to 
do all the nuclear explosions, which they did in uh, the North Pole, uh, you know, in the, in the Arctic region. But um, one of the things they want to do is put a load of sulfur into the atmosphere. Yeah. And I don't know if you that, know this. That's the Pinatubo effect. That's what volcanoes do. They, they spray, you know, soot and sulfur into the stratosphere. That's what Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Teller Wood and Hyde, um, yeah. you know, that, that was their whole inspiration behind this. And that's why Ken but, called but, it. But, Go ahead. Yeah, there's an interesting um, um, problem about the Mount Pinatibu eruption. This is when they say we had a massive global cooling. And mm-hmm. from then onwards, we started to get warmer. Yeah. And it, that, what, that what they tried to say is that volcano caused such a huge effect that it caused the cooling. But what they fail um, to include in their data so that all their models are wrong mm-hmm is uh, all the particles from the Iraq oil fields that were burning. That's right. Um, and, and that, that is so an excellent many point. Months, many, many months and billions of barrels of oil yeah. uh, in uncontrollable fires for many months. Um, these put so many particles into the atmosphere that they would mask the effect of Mount Pinatibu. So when they say, oh, Mount Pinatibu caused all this cooling, there is a classic example of how valuable climate science is because they failed to include all the particles from the Iraq oil burn. Yeah, cloud aerosol interaction is the greatest unknown in climate science, so much so that the, at, the arm.gov they're running around everywhere trying to figure out this aerosol issue, um, how it affects the radiation balance of the world. Yet, back to the AMEG thing real quickly, yeah. um, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, they have this thing called the Clathrate Gun Hypothesis. And it's, you know, basically the, the, the impetus for this global warming boogeyman they have, and it goes like this. They drilled in the Arctic ice back to the time of the dinosaurs they saw a lot of co2 and then they saw a lot of methane and they said that killed the dinosaurs so let me get this straight dinosaur (laughs) farts melted (laughs) methane under the ocean and under the ice that methane then vented and caused runaway global warming that's called the clathrate gun hypothesis so ameg pushed this narrative, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, and they went and they sent this letter to world leaders saying, use more bunker fuel in in, in ships so we make more ship tracks, start spraying titanium dioxide all over the planet, start stockpiling it and making sure that planes can, you know, burn it in their fuel um, and relax the restriction on polar Arctic flights, which would lead to more of those black highways we're talking about. But this is the craziest one. Use transmitters like HARP to compress atmospheric methane into diamond dust. And that was called Project Lucy. I have a paper on it, Project Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And this is from John Neeson, Malcolm Light, and AMEG. This is the crazy part. What do we see today? A massive increase in noctilucent cloud formation over the poles. This is not a coincidence, but the scariest part is this. AMEG... The same guys that said all this stuff about geoengineering the Arctic to save it have another proposal called the Angels Proposal. Arctic natural gas extraction, liquefaction, and sales. And they basically say, frack the Arctic to get the gas out before we end up having runaway global warming because of the clathrate gun hypothesis <laughs> Because dinosaur farts. Yeah, the, Jap- the Japanese have perfected that method actually of uh, extracting. Joe, Joe Meg, they're doing it off the coast. They're doing it in the ocean now. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to say something. Uh, historically, um, we really have been warmer than we are today. So anyone concerned about global warming and we're all going to perish, it's ridiculous, really. There were 5,000 Vikings living. For 400 years in Greenland. That's a substantial amount of time mm-hmm. to survive. Now, Greenland today, I happen to look um, on my weather reports at Nuke, we're in UK, which is the capital of Greenland, and it's pretty much uh, below zero all the time. 
Mm-hmm. Yet when the Vikings were living there for 400 years, they were able to produce all the food. They were able to um, produce barley to make beer. They grew mm. their own wood. They had trees. They used willow trees that were fast-growing trees. Mm-hmm. And there's there's been scientific studies on the changes on insects found in the dwellings that show there was a sudden transition. So basically, we're talking about how the Earth goes in cycles. We've been warmer before, and um, then there was a sudden cooling, and that was why they ended up perishing, really. Um, but this isn't just recorded. The, the climate change promoters will say, well, this was a glitch, and, and what happened there isn't representative of what was happening all over the planet. Except we have accurate records from China that corroborate that actually they had a warming period there in exactly the same, same time scale. Yeah. So it, and, it, and this is about solar cycles. I mean, in my climate change um, hierarchy, it's pretty simple. It's the sun, galactic cosmic rays, cloud formation, water vapor, and then greenhouse gases. That's that's the things that affect the temperature of the planet in that order. Galactic cosmic rays affect cloud formation, and affect what water. Doing? Those, huh? those 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 um, those uh, ele- those galactic rays. What are they actually doing? Cosmic rays, they call them. Yeah, cosmic rays. What are they doing? What are they doing? They are those the they are the ions. static that make everything stick together. Yeah, they're the ions. They're I the mean, muons, the ions, and all that no, stuff. Yeah which is part of what they're learning to do and have been they've been looking at the uh, electrical activity in the atmosphere for over 200 years you had um, balloons going up in 1806 Guy Lussac who was measuring the electrical activity and that was when they first discovered cosmic rays um, so, so they are learning they're learning about nature and learning how to mimic it. That's one of the things they're actually doing is mm-hmm. um, learning to modify the global electric circuit in different locations where they want, because because they want cloud cover, or they don't want cloud cover. You know, there's there's it's quite complicated, but it is something that's often overlooked is the electrical component to the atmosphere that they are modifying. B- Bernard Vonnegut. Um, w- space charging 1954 exactly uh, he um the original yeah most people don't know this vincent schaefer and irving langmeyer get all the credit for inventing cloud seeding but bernard vonnegut brother of the famous author um he was fascinated by the electrical process the electrical aspects a- aspects yeah. of this okay jim though no, but but look I-, I sent you a um a paper very, very recently from um, a guy called Luke Howard. And in 1803, he wrote some essays on the electrical modification of clouds. And it's, um, I, I got that from the UK Met Office. Now, in 1806, there's a book about climate change around Great Britain. Um, I can't remember the guy's name at the moment. I should have prepared for that better. But in this book from 1806, he suggests putting a series of antennas around the coastline to electrically sta- um, statically charge mist to turn them into clouds to make it rain. That's right. That's right. And, and that's, I, that's, I, that's I know the paper you're talking about. And, yeah, and that's the missing component from all these discussions is it's cloud seed plus water vapor, but you still need static. And the static is what makes it stick together. Um, so the electrical component now is well documented with ionospheric heaters and cloud ionizers. Um, you can read about it on, on climateviewer.com, cloud ionization and electric weather modification. Um, these guys are putting these ion generators all over the planet. And I just did one on the Russian woodpecker and how, um, you know, Colonel Bearden and you know Thomas Bearden, all of them were talking about how they were using ten hertz signals to create standing waves um, in the in the sky to to affect weather on the ground, and how, that's exactly what they do. Harry Wexler warned that sounding rockets were punching holes in the ionosphere, and that that 
alone could control the global weather such as the jet streams and all of that so this is this One is the big love to hear is huh? harry Wetzler's, um on the possibilities of weather and climate modification um he, he gave two presentations before he was uh, unfortunately killed in his 50s i think he was 54 he was on a holiday and he died of i was attack. 61 yeah he was 61 he was supposed oh, was he? To, yeah oh. 61 he was supposed to give the speech he never did dr jim fleming discovered this um and 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 he and and you know it, it's like a, the holy grail you know what i mean and what happened was the very next year after he warned that the rand corporation said we need to do more sounding rocket experiments and they exploded from there so you know he tried to warn that this could control the world's weather and jet streams and all that through changing the electrical processes overhead and that's what they've been doing ever since um it's the major focus so you said earlier that the but 70s it was hot in um in uh your, you know your locality well 70s and 80s there, there was a paper I have. Is ELF able to control the weather, to manipulate weather from popular communications, 1984? And there are two scientists on record saying exactly that, that they were heating the sky to control the weather over America. We had, you know, the coldest records on temperature, the largest El Nino ever. It was out of its normal regular cycle, and it was because of ground-based microwaves. And I, I want to... Um say something about harry wexler like uh, one of his main focuses on weather and climate modification was about ozone and depleting ozone. yeah now the thing is if you depleted ozone we all know now after what's happened in australia and other locations that you get an intensification of uv and other other rays don't forget there's lots of rays coming from the sun there's x-rays gamma rays and i don't even know the whole list there's a long line long list lots of radiation and, so, so what we're talking about is electrons, really, in rays that can be used for weather modification. And the ozone is a protective layer that limits the amount of exposure. So that if you remove ozone, you're then bringing in a new bit of resource, these rays, from the sun, these intensified rays, because the protection's gone, because the ozone's been stripped away. You've got a method then to use for weather modification. And an interesting thing that Harry Wexler said that if you were to do ozone depletion, you would scorch the plants, you would co create famine in countries. And so many people have seen plants with burnt leaves or curled leaves or, and, or damaged. And his tree. warning also was that it was caused by sound by rocket experiment rockets punching holes in the ionosphere. And what did they do? They ignored all of that and went straight to well, it's CFCs. You know, well, CFCs are what what are depleting the ozone, like sulfur hexafluoride. But guess what they did? They put that on satellites and sounding rockets and sprayed sulfur hexafluoride directly into the ionosphere. Um, for you know these experiments, they heated them with the Arecibo ionospheric heater. Um, the combined rocket release experimental satellite CRES had it would spray trimethyl aluminum, barium, and sulfur hexafluoride. So everything Harry Wexler warned about, they did. Um, rocket launches for just putting satellites in space, let alone the sounding rocket experiments and the weather modification rocket experiments. All of these rockets put aluminum and barium into the sky, and, and they the, just, the residuals are coming down today. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the residency time in the in the upper atmosphere is decades. Decades. That's right. What goes up comes down, but it might just take a little longer, and that's what geoengineering is all about. So we should probably tie a bow on this because I I think we're well over an hour now and yeah, I, so I'd love to do this again with you man because I could I literally could talk to you for four or five hours we do, we used to have like two and three hour phone calls I don't know how you ever afforded that <laughs> using Skype mate <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do want to say that um, in this book here uh, if this comes up can you see that book can you see the top I'm getting book? a really long there he is yes Yes, weather modification in the Soviet Union, 46 okay. through 66. Well, they started cloud seeding experiments in 1919. 
Yep. Almost yep. 100 years ago. And, you know, looking at patents, there's a patent from 1890 something or other about um, dispersing liquid CO2 from balloons, um, you know, for cloud seeding purposes. I mean, the thing is, I mean, it's so good what you've done with your weather modification history of website. I appreciate that. I was, yeah, I was going to bring that up really quickly on the screen because if you go to weathermodificationhistory.com and you take a look right here at the top is newspapers, you can see these newspapers from 1800 to present. Um, and, and it goes through some pretty crazy stuff, you know, like, you know, using x-rays um, to like this oh, one right here producing actually, what you that x-rays are called Rontgen rays as well. Yeah, so the, the, the Soviets, Sacramento Union, the Soviets actually 1919. Did, they they use Rontgen rays for weather modification. So it's it's not just the 1918 patent from Basile or whatever his name is, um, the Australian guy. The actual the Soviets are actually using it as well. Yeah, yeah and, and it's, it's not just an American phenomena; it's a worldwide phenomena. Blast clouds with sand, 1872, popular science. The sky is losing its blue as some cloudiness alters its appearance. 1927. Um, it's just you, if you do, those who don't those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. That's why I created weather modification history. That's why um, we you know work so diligently on it. And I'm trying to put together a section for Max's research because basically. Dominic Marama, he he goes and finds these newspaper articles and spends a whole lot of time getting them into one image because they're usually on multiple different pages and it's you know Google News, different sources, going to Washington Post, all these different sources of the internet and trying to get it into one image so that people can read the whole article, know that this was history, and and get familiar with the names, the terms, the technology. Um, I, I have been trying to work on a section so that I can put in there just like research reference papers um and max has been sending me a list of those for the better part of a year and a half now since since we created the site and as soon as that's available i'm going to put all those links he's been sending me in there so that you can read them um every single one of them because if you really want you know the, the history is important but we have to also know what's going on today and constantly citations are built on the backs of other people's work and they're bullshit too. And James Roger Fleming said it best when he said that there were the pathological cycles of weather modification of hope and hype that first it was the pluviculturalists um, and that's from like 1800 to 1946. Then it was cloud seeding. And now today it's geoengineering. And what these all have in common are this. It's men making promises they can't keep, saying that they can control a thing they cannot, and they are experimenting overhead, and they have been for well over 200 years in secrecy. And that's, yeah, right there, Fixing the Sky, the Checkered History of Weather Modification. Um, James Roger Fleming, I interviewed him. He's my personal hero, um, and you can see my he's interview. He's a very nice chap, actually, isn't he? He's a nice guy. Yeah, he, he's, he's very, um, uh, what's the word? He's a very humble individual who is filled to the brim with information and has written you know, the best, one of the best books ever on the subject. And he said to me personally that, you know, my solution, the Environmental Modification Accountability Act could really bring a change to this, you know, especially with the, 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 the harp stuff, the ionospheric heater, the sounding rockets, what he found with Harry Wexler. He wants to delve into the electrical aspects in his next book. And I really can barely wait to read it. So that's that did we're we are making history right now, um, and I want people to feel that we are winning, and that's part of the reason that you know I'm putting my face out there now and doing these videos is that people are so demoralized and feel so oppressed by you know the the overwhelming history of it and the fact that we have no say so in this, but it's guys like you and me who are you know going to change the world. And I hope that we can leave this a better place where hopefully man leaves weather alone just completely. I mean, that would be the ideal situation. Let's find out what natural weather is like in 2020 instead of moving towards this technocrat dream of global governance and geoengineering.
so Max, is there anything you want to plug or anything you want to say before we wrap this thing up, man? No, but I could go. Through, we'll have to do a section where I can go through all my books here. There's like modification of the area environment of crops. So this book is, uh, I think it's from the 70s. Um, basically, there's so many different books, so many aspects about how they want to modify the planet um, for their own personal gains. You know, it's, it's not, not for the benefit of people. Mm. Um, so, so I, but what I got, blue gold? They say that water water's will water's be to the next century. What? Water. Yeah, water yeah, will yeah, be to the next century. So what weird. oil was to the last? Yeah, yeah, blue gold, and and, and you know you've got the globalists buying up um, these aquifers and water supplies, and these corporations taking control of water supplies all around the world, and it's ver- it's really it's. It's almost like criminality out in the open. And, um, you know, it should be a basic human right. Um, this planet is all an amazing, self-sustaining... Organism. Bias. It, and it, I believe it is probably an organism uh, it, it, in a collective way. And the people that, who are trying to dominate and control this are not good custodians. They're not good people. They're greedy, sociopaths, they're psychopaths. They will do incredible things with ridiculous experiments like setting off 2,050 nuclear bombs. That's they right. will explode crazy things in the atmosphere. They, they, they're continuously poisoning this planet, but they would like to blame us for the poisoning of the planet, which is ridiculous because we're just the end users of That's the right. products they create. You know, we, we, it's not our fault don't blame yourself for using plastic because none of us ever invented plastic. You know, and we, and we and sure as heck didn't make up. marijuana illegal, which could have made oil from hemp. Um, yeah. But it was cer- they certainly did do that, and that was Dow Chemical and company who made sure that all that oil and plastic was created from poisonous sources as opposed to sustainable ones back in the 30s. So, and how was that done? Through control, <laughs> through fear, and through language. So uh, yeah, and they, they control the media, and they they can put publication. They they control the public publication houses, so they actually authorize who can publish books. You know, like, yeah. sorry, the work gets published. Yeah, there's six major publishers of all of the. <laughs> Just like within the mainstream media, at the top there are six companies that control almost all of the TV media. Um, in the 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 scientific, the scholarly world, there are three major pub, six major publishing houses, and they are the gatekeepers. They decide what gets in and what gets cited and what gets thrown out and mocked. But you know, at first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they mock you, fight you, and you win. So I think we're in the winning stage now um, because they really don't have any arguments left and all the evidence is out there. It's just people need to act on it. And that's what we're, we're talking about today is, you know, using, you know, if you have to swallow that bitter pill when, when in Rome and when you're hanging out with scientists, you know, know the terminology use it properly and, and they just, they, they bend right over for you. I mean, there's not much they can do. No, um, I will say this. When I was in Berlin at the chemical, uh, at the climate engineering conference, uh, the guy that was actually in charge of it, Mark Lawrence, uh, I, I did get a chance to have a few conversations with him. And uh, he said to me that, um, oh, you should use the term chemtrails. <laughs> the problem was, he was almost. His smile, it was almost hard for him to contain his smile at the time. Because basically what he's saying is, please use the word chemtrails because then we can ignore you. Yes, please. I want to be able to just like discount everything you're saying and it makes it so much easier. Chemtrails to me is a trap. It it is, it's, yes, it's it's a useful way to um, call them because we know what we're talking about um, within certain circles but if you want to talk to the establishment then all you're doing is walking into a trap just be scientific they are deliberately creating contrails as part 
of many years of weather and climate modification programs they are using for nefarious purposes, not to save us from global warming, but actually to um, con the masses into con believing there is a global trails. That's what, yeah. that's why I have it up on the screen. Oh, Hashtag oh, okay. Cirrus yeah. Clouds Matter. Um, because at the end of the day, this is a lot about language. And, you know, there's many different terms for this. Persistent contrails, spreading contrails, contrail cirrus, contrail-induced cirrus, contrail-induced cloudiness, aviation-induced cloudiness. But they're all artificial oh, I clouds. I mean, yeah. and, and we've already got admissions from, you know, those individuals like Chuck Long, that it's accidental geoengineering. Um, I just recently wrote a paper on MIT's Climate X, and it's titled Accidental Geoengineering with Ship Tracks and Contrails. This is no longer an accident. No, you, no, they no, can't no. claim it's an accident any longer. What's the definition of geoengineering? The deliberate intervention in the Earth's climatic systems. So you can't have accidental deliberate yeah, and, 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 and the same thing is true with chemtrails. <clears throat> it is all, the entire chemtrail debate rides on a single word, intent. And and people will say, well, their intentions are to do this, and their intentions are to do that. I focus on, you know, the, the how it works instead of what, trying to read people's minds. Um, and when you just look at it that way, the way you do as well, just what are the facts? The facts are planes make clouds. Those clouds do X, Y, and Z. Um, what, you know, if we want to talk about people's agendas, then we're trying to be mind readers with the lack of evidence. But, but we can talk about people like Ken Caldera, who has his patent for creating clouds and yeah. precipitation. Yeah. And some of that involves airplanes depositing particles. Oh, man. The, then to be hit with uh, ion beams or laser beams. or he anything, was, uh, In the patent thing, it said literally rent an ion cannon to a farmer so that he can either create or destroy clouds over his fields. Yeah, but the interesting thing about his particular paper um, was he had a flow chart about how a customer would order clouds or rain mm -hmm. or whatever, and funds would be, it's about money. Same thing. You know? he, he, Ken Caldera, Dr. Stephen Salter, you talked to, and Bill Gates have a patent on steering hurricanes and it's at a uh, you know a notify oil field that a hurricane's coming and that we can steer the hurricane away get money from the oil field and then we will operate storm suppression equipment so it's not about just geoengineering to save us from co2 this is about controlling the freaking weather and yeah. and and geoengineering is cloud seeding is pluviculture it's all been the same thing they're all chemical trails they're either chemical or electric period so yeah. It's all splitting hairs. It's it, it's it's language control. I like to call it slave speak. You can read about that. But yeah, that's um, a very good article you've done about. Yeah, it. that um, the anatomy of slave speak. If you have not read it, you need to truly wake yourself up with it. It'll change your life. Um, but the the this is the my favorite quote. Um, one of the saddest lessons in history is this: if we've been bamboozled uh, long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we've been taken. Once that you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. Carl Sagan. Um, and, you, and Sally Kempton said, It is hard to fight an enemy who has outposts in your head. Uh, language creates spooks that get into your head and hypnotize us. And that's really what's going on here. Like, people have been so indoctrinated with the whole chemtrail narrative by so many of these fear porn industry artists that they, weren't, they won't even accept, um, you know, any alternative facts that you can present them. And likewise, the scientific community has been so preconditioned through perception management techniques to, to totally discount anybody who ever says the word chemtrails when that is exactly what they do with silver iodide, with trimethyl aluminum, barium, and all these other chemicals. They put trails of chemicals in the sky to modify weather and do X, Y, and Z. So language aside, we know most of the facts. 
And that, we just need to act on that now. And that's why I'm proposing this in my legislation to give some teeth to that weather warfare ban. Um, and that's my pragmatic solution. I hope that everybody will try to be solution based. It's an interesting thing that there was a, a paper from 1970 about the number of ice crystals in ice fog generated from a, an aircraft. And basically, the number of ice crystals in aircraft plumes is greater than what they achieve with professional cloud seeding operations. So what you've got is... On the possibility those- of weather modification by aircraft contrail said that aircraft are likely altering weather to a greater extent than present cloud seeding operations. That's the one you're talking about. Yeah. Um, it, there's also um, um, a paper that was done in 1980 from Illinois uh, about the effects of clouds, where a unique study was done from, from the early 20th century up until for 80 year study uh, looking at all the weather changes through the days that correlating it with god weather. man see you're i we're trying to wrap up here but what you're talking yeah. about that that 1980 paper came as a result of yeah. the state of illinois and new jersey sued over chemtrails in 1970 to 72 and they said that smoke pollution of the skies that was chemtrails in 1972 that that the chicago skies were completely blotted out by aircraft travel and those two states sued the airline industry over it and that's why the illinois university cloud physics department was created was to actually go well crap man you know this has now happened we got lawsuits flying over this and we don't know anything about it um, so that's just fascinating that you brought that up. And the airline industry, just to summarize the lawsuit, um, Secretary of Transportation uh, Volp um, you know, mediated uh, the, the 43 airline carriers in the two states and tried to settle out of court. And they said they would install burner cans to reduce, um, you know, it's, a, it's, you know, the combustor in the jet engine, yeah. that it would reduce particulate emissions by 70%. Flash forward to today, our EPA lawsuit got thrown out, and they said they would use biofuels for contrail control. And in that signatory thing they had going on there, what do they say? We hope to use biofuels to reduce particulate emissions by, wait for it, 70%. Coincidences. They're not, there's no coincidences. They just no. they, they have never been regulated because you cannot see the cloud if there are no clouds. Planes make clouds. Ships make um, clouds. Exactly. Yes. Uh, to, I mean, we know what happens when they're grounded. We get lovely blue skies. Simple as that. And, yep. and as a fact, we, we've, we've got some of the proof. We know what would happen if planes did not fly. We'd have blue skies. That is a fact um, but here here's the scary fact I'll, I'll i'll flip that on and i'll play devil's advocate <laughs> so jasper kirkby cern cloud project proved that trees make clouds and all the climate models are wrong um that uh dr rick shankman pointed out to me in a paper about frost band that pseudomonas syringae which is a cloud seeding bacteria it's what makes ice on crops so Monsanto and companies like that with their pesticides are killing bacteria on the ground that also make clouds. So if you cut down all the forests that make clouds and you spray everything with pesticides that kills the bacteria that makes clouds and then you coat the ocean in plastic so water evaporation doesn't occur properly anymore and you totally screw up the normal natural hydrological cycle, what are you left with? Planes put water in the sky and make clouds. Cloud seeders try to make it fall on the ground. So are we really in a situation where we have screwed this planet up so badly that all this weather, not we, they, that that, that the massive industry and greed has destroyed this planet to the point where if they stop doing it, it'll never rain again? I don't believe that for a second. I think nature is, a, is an incredible thing that is a balancing uh, mechanism that would, would very quickly come back into balance. I agree with you on that. Well, 
Max, this has been an excellent discussion. Holy crap, man. We could do this all day long. Um, I have phone calls like this with some of my favorite people. I hope to interview them just like we're doing now. And you're definitely going to be doing this again with me. Um, is there anything you want to say in closing that's not going to get us into another hour-long discussion, brother man? <laughs> no, no, I really appreciate everything you're doing. Um, and um, I would say to people out there that are learning about this, all the information is actually out there. Yeah. It is open source material. Don't be frightened to go looking for it. You do have to learn a little bit about the lingo, you know, the scientific jargon. You do have to spend some time reading, but the information is out there. And people like Jim have created excellent resources to find all this information. Thank you, man. Um, so don't be frightened about learning this. And when you have learned a little bit, don't be frightened about talking about it. That's right. And knowing is half the battle. So everybody, you can get educated. Um, WeatherModificationHistory.com. ClimateViewer.com is my blog. ClimateViewer.org is my, my 3D map where you can see a weather modification projects from around the world. See every single harp and ionospheric heater in the world mapped out in 3D. Where would you where, give, plug? You got a website anymore, man? Because I, I I've, I've got a, I've got a website, but it's lost at the moment. I, it I, seems to I, be. I, I, yeah. It's called unearthclimatechange.com. But, um, Say that I again. Unearthclimatechange.com. Unearthclimatechange. No you won't find anything there at the moment because it, the DNS codes are lost in my, my old domain supplier. I need to get them back so I can get the site back up and then do more work on it. Well, I want you um, to remind me via email, and I'm going to help you with that personally because we need to get you back, get the real institute back online because... It's not enough for you to just be sending me those emails, man. I want you to be con a contributor at Weather Mod History. I am you. You are a contributor there because many of the timeline posts already contain stuff that you sent to me personally. And from me to you, thank you, brother man, for for believing in me and continuing to do the research and do the legwork to find some of these papers. Because I'm busy as hell, and I know you're busy as hell. But when we work together, magic you know magic occurs, and we can really flesh this out for all the other people. People who are lost in a sea of fear porn um, so knowledge is power and I hope that people will continue to get educated on this support guys like Max Bliss you can find him on Facebook's Max Bliss um, for certain he's there um, but you know pretty soon I'll provide some links to on weather modification history to his website when we get him back on the internet properly yeah yeah that'd be so good <laughs> all right max well i love you man i appreciate what you do and um for everybody at home this this has been an epic video i know that you guys um you know probably heard a lot of stuff you've never heard anywhere else i hope that you'll continue to you know dig into the material that you just heard share this video support guys like max and myself and attack ideas not people if this video resonates with you, leave me a comment because I love hearing from you all. First time here? Be sure to subscribe and click the bell. The bell doesn't always work, so come to ClimateViewer.com and sign up for our newsletter. Remember, it would be impossible for me to do this without your support, so please join my Patreon or buy me a coffee on PayPal. And always, attack ideas, not people.